So this is about cohomological Hall algebras and motivic invariance of curves. And uh, so we have to, I first want to somehow explain the aim and scope of this series of lectures. And we have to answer the questions uh, what, why, and uh, how, and where. Uh, so this is a school on enumerative geometry. And uh, we want to enumerate things which don't seem too geometric, namely quiver representations. Yeah, so we want to, for how utmost aim is to want to count quiver representations. So why? Why do we want to count quiver representations? So we'll first see that uh, quiver representations form a category which is similar to categories of coherent sheaves on curves. Namely, it's a category, it's a nice abelian category of global dimension one. So one point is that category of representations of a quiver Q is in some respect similar to coherent sheaves on a smooth projective curve. Of course, there are essential differences in general, but they are somehow similar. For example, because both are categories of global dimension equal to one. Yeah, and so this is kind of a non-commutative counterpart to curves or coherent sheaves on curves. So we are doing non-commutative geometry of curves and we want to enumerate something. What's that mean? <laughs> okay, I'll be careful. Um, okay, so that's the first reason why we want to do this. Second reason uh, is that quivers are something of like a toy model for more interesting things, maybe for you more interesting things like um, quivers with potential, so three Calabi-Yau situation, so for two or three Calabi-Yau situations, like quivers with potentials. But most of the time, I will only treat the quiver case and really view it as a toy model. And understanding all the phenomena in the quiver case, you are then prepared for studying the real stuff, like quivers with potential. OK. Um, another reason for studying quivers is that if you are really interested in some category of, of sheaves, but you are interested in some local phenomena, phenomena like uh, only involving sheaves which are filtered by a finite number of, of basic objects. Then if you are lucky, you can model everything by a quiver situation. Many other situations in categories of coherent sheaves or in enumerative geometry can be modeled by quivers. And I don't want to be too precise here at the moment. We will see some instances of, of this principle later. Yeah, so that's why we uh, look at, at this quiver situation, although it seems quite far from the usual setup of enumerating things coming from algebraic geometry. OK, so that's the why. And uh, now to the what and where. Where do we count? <coughs> well, and you have certainly seen uh, at the school already uh, that doing enumerative geometry, counting things, can be much, much more sophisticated than just taking the cardinality of a finite set. You can have counts which are negative, which are even only rational or whatever. Yeah? So uh, finding the right, the right 
domain where to count things is highly non-trivial. And uh, this is also what happens here in, in this theory. So, well, if you have an honest finite number of quiver representations, we can just count the cardinality of this finite set. But that's not what usually happens. You can have parametric families of quiver representations. So, for example, you could have a P1 family. So what is the count for a P1 family? And uh, so we need the right domain where to count. And this will be the Grotendieck ring of varieties. And uh, this I will introduce in a minute. So all our counts will be in certain variants of Grotendieck rings of varieties. So these are very simple-minded motives, and that's where this motivic invariant comes from. Yeah? So motivic invariants are some invariants associated to quiver representations, which are counts, but counts in the Grotendieck ring of varieties. So that's the, the where. And uh, another question is, what are quiver representations? And this is also something I should tell you today. So today I will first uh, explain the Grotendieck ring of varieties, because that's where we will count things. And uh, then I will give you some basic terminology uh, on quiver representations, in case you don't know it. And then finally we will consider the, the motivic generating function, which is something like a partition function. So then finally we will see as a three third part today AQ, a certain motivic generating function, and this will be an element of a so-called motivic quantum torus, which, I will, which we will introduce. Okay, so that's the plan for today. And let me just give you an, an outlook of how we continue. So today will be just mostly definitions and concepts. Yeah, so where do we count? What do we count? And uh, it's just about writing down this so-called motivic partition function and uh, exploring it in a, in a few very, very simple examples. And then tomorrow we will continue and... Uh, so tomorrow we will take this motivic generating function AQ and factor it. And trying to factor it will lead us to all sorts of moduli spaces of quiver representations and their motivic invariants, their motives. So factoring this leads to moduli spaces. And in a special case, hopefully I can do this tomorrow, uh, this will lead us to certain gromov witten invariants and the connection is via the so-called tropical vertex. And uh, so maybe we will see this already tomorrow. And then talk three and four will be about taking all these concepts from the first two talks, which are really just enumerating things, lots of explicit identities, and categorifying them. Categorify all the identities which we will produce in an algebraic object called the cohomological Hall algebra of the quiver. Yeah? But before we categorify, we have to see the numerical stuff. So, what is this counting really about? So, uh, that's my current idea of the uh, outline of the four talks, and uh, let's see how this develops. And I'm, I'm really happy to skip uh, most of this if you're interested in different things. Uh, so please just tell me. All right. So let's start with the first part of today's talk, introducing this Grotendieck ring of varieties. And uh, okay. So, let's work over the base field of complex numbers. That's enough for today. So, let's introduce the Grotendieck ring of 
varieties over C. And uh, so what notion of variety do we, do we take? Actually, that's not so important for defining the Skirtendy ring of varieties. The Skirtendy ring of varieties is not too sensitive on the fine difference of reduced and non-reduced structures. And uh, one question is always, do you view as a variety as something irreducible or not? Let's just say a quasi-projective, not necessarily irreducible variety. So really, in the naive sense, take complex projective space of some dimension and take some polynomial equalities and inequalities. So something locally closed in a complex projective space. That's our notion of variety. Yeah? Okay. Then we introduce K0 of RC. We first take something really, really large. Namely, we take the free abelian group in all isomorphism classes of such varieties. Free abelian group in isoclasses of complex varieties. And uh, I hope we don't have any set theoretic issues here. How to define such a variety? Well, you first have to fix a number for the dimension of the projective space. Then you take finitely many polynomials and defining the polynomial equations and inequalities. And that's it. So that's maybe something we can do inside sets. OK. So it's mostly harmless to just take this free abelian group in the set of isomorphism classes. Uh, and then we mod out uh, a relation, just one relation, namely the cut and paste relation. Modulo the cut and paste relation, which is x equals a plus u if a in X is a closed subvariety with open complement U. That's the cut and paste relation, yeah? So whenever you have a closed subvariety, so whenever you have a decomposition of variety into a closed subvariety and it's open complement, then you require additivity. And this is a relation we force on, on this free abelian group. That's it. All right, so um, we will do a few computations in there, but let's first continue to define a ring structure on it, because at the moment it's just a group, and the ring structure is just given by multiplication. Multiplication is just given by the Cartesian product of varieties. Perfect. Um, what else do we need? Um, we need the so-called Lefschetz motif L, blackboard style L, which is defined as the motif of the affine line. All right. That's uh, almost it for the moment. We need some, well, two more definitions, but let's start with, okay, so please leave some space here at the end of the definition. So, uh, elements of this K0 are called <coughs> mod. Exactly. X of variety, complex variety, then the class of X is called the motive. of x. So motives in a very naive sense, just the classes in this, in this group. And uh, well, OK, so there's a, there's a lot to say about this, this ring. And uh, I will not give you all the things which are known about this ring. Uh, for example, how it relates to birationality of varieties. That's a, another very interesting story, but we don't need this. And actually, Oh, let's just do some example calculations. Yeah, so I will continue the definition a little bit, but 
let's first start with examples. Um, what is the class of affine space? Affine n space. Well, affine n space you can um, realize as the n fold Cartesian product of the affine line. Yeah? So, Cartesian product is the product in this ring, and the class of the affine line has a special name, the Lefschetz motive. So, this is just the nth power of the Lefschetz motive. Wonderful. Okay. Ah, that was our first computation in this ring. Uh, another computation is projective space. Well, projective space realized as, uh, well, you have uh, homogeneous coordinates from 0 to n, and uh, you have a very nice stratification of projective space by deciding whether the zeroth homogeneous coordinate is 0 or non-zero. If the zeroth coordinate is non-zero, you can normalize it to 1 and you get an affine space principle affine open. And the complement of this is when the first, uh, when the zeroth homogeneous coordinate is zero, and this leaves projective space of one smaller dimension. No? Okay. So this is just the set where the zero coordinate is non-zero, and this is defined by zero coordinate being zero. All right, uh, that's an open, and that's a closed complement. So we see that the class of Pn is the class of An plus the class of Pn minus 1, where we now have used the cut and paste relation for the first time. And this is, of course, the basis uh, for an induction, because you can continue with Pn minus 1 and decompose it into an minus 1 and pn minus 2, and so on. So, doing this inductively, you arrive at an plus an minus 1 plus plus a1 plus a0, which is just the class of a point. Okay? So, since an can be realized as powers of the, of the Lefschetz motive, we can realize this as a truncated geometric series. So, in other words, the motive of projective space is 1 minus L to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus L, the truncated geometric series. Aha. Uh -huh. And you already see that, uh, well, this is, of course, uh, completely formal expression at the moment, but it might be useful to allow denominators like 1 minus L. Yeah? And this we will continue with the next example. What's the class of the, the motive of the Grassmannian? The Grassmannian of k-dimensional subspaces of n-dimensional space. Uh, well, if k equals 1, this is just the case of projective space, because projective space just is the Grassmannian of lines Okay, Pn is GR1, n plus 1. The Grassmannian, uh, the projective space, just the Grassmannian of one dimensional subspaces of n plus 1 dimensional space. And uh, this decomposition into the, of the projective space generalizes using the, the Schubert decompositions. Yeah? So, using the Schubert cells, the Schubert varieties, you can prove that this is the so-called quantum binomial or Gaussian binomial coefficient evaluated at L, the Lefschetz motive. And if you haven't seen this in quantum group theory or wherever, let me introduce it for you. So let me define n, the quantum number, and q uh, as 1 minus q to the n by 1 minus q. Let's then define the quantum factorial as product of quantum numbers. And then we define the quantum binomial as fraction of uh, quantum factorials. Okay, that's the, the standard way for introducing these Gaussian 
uh, binomial coefficients. Yeah? So you define the binomial coefficient as n factorial by k factorial n minus k factorial. You quantize this. The factorials are just products of numbers. So, okay. so you just have to quantize numbers and the quantization of the number n is 1 minus q to the n by 1 minus q. And uh, of course, this reminds us of the truncated geometric series we have encountered in the motive of projective space. So, exercise, compute the motive of GLN. <coughs> uh, we will do this uh, later anyway when we introduce this motivic generating function of a quiver. So, hint is that, well, think about this is an invertible matrix. What are the possibilities for the first column? When the first column of an invertible matrix, you can have any vector except zero. Then, fixing this in the second color, column, you can have any vector except anything in the line generated by the first vector and so on. Yeah? And if you write this down carefully in terms of certain vibrations, then you can compute the motive of the general linear group. All right. Okay, so this ends the examples for... Uh, now we need some... Mm, some two ingredients for this Grotendieck ring of varieties, which I cannot motivate easily at the moment. And uh, so I'm afraid at the moment you just have to believe that this will be relevant. So first of all, we will make this, this thing here formal, that sometimes we want to have denominators. And in fact, we want to have even more potential denominators. And then we need the notion of the virtual motive, which is a little twist, but which will be very important for the motivic Donaldson-Thomas theory. I can't explain this at the moment. It's all about virtual fundamental classes of moduli spaces. And uh, so at the moment, this, uh, the next definition will be somewhat unmotivated. And I just can say, believe me, it will be important later. Okay. We will uh, work in the localization. And now let me just call this the, the motivic ring, our mod for short. So we take this Grotendieck ring and we allow ourselves to, first of all, to invert the Lefschetz motive. So we want to be able to invert the affine line. And if you already know something about this Grotendieck ring, uh, then you will think, then well you know that this is a terrible idea, a priori, and really have to see if anything survives. I will tell you in a few minutes. So we will invert the Lefschetz motive, and also for reasons of so-called virtual motives and virtual fundamental classes, we need a square root of it. So we will even uh, need the square root of the Lefschetz motive. And I want to invert all these 1 minus L to the n, where we have seen the very beginning here in calculating the motive of projective space. Lambda, there's no lambda. Sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. 1 minus L to the n. So, this looks a bit arbitrary at the moment, but for example, localizing at all these um, brings us to the, well, this is nothing I would really, I will really use, but it's the fact that this is then the Grotendieck ring of um, certain classes of stacks, namely quotient stacks by all groups GL. Yeah? If you form, if you want to define a Grotendieck group of stacks, where stacks are, everything can form out of quotient stacks by GLN, then you get this localization. So it also appears in nature, if you view stacks as nature. Um, and this is, as I already said, for these virtual motives, 
And this is now the final part of the definition. The virtual motive is defined as a little twist to the motive of x. Namely, we twist it to minus L one half to minus the dimension of x uh, for x irreducible. Yeah? And um, <coughs> so just as a, as a very simple example, Let's just look at the virtual motive of, of P1, because the essential feature of these virtual motives, I can already illustrate this example. So we take the usual motive of P1, and we twist it by minus square root of the left shit's motive to minus the dimension of the projective line, which is minus 1. So minus L1 half to the minus 1 times P1, and this is L1 half plus L to the minus one half. Yeah, because the motive of P1 was 1 plus L. Okay. Um, is this fine or did I make a sign mistake? I certainly made a sign mistake here, minus. Sorry. So, and just note that this is stable under switching L and L inverse. And that's the uh, important feature of this, uh, I mean, okay, this is just by Poincaré duality in this example, and this is somehow the, uh, the main feature of this virtual motive that it makes things more symmetric. Okay, everything else will follow. Okay, so, Now we have to be very careful. Uh, it might be that we are, uh, that in working in with this ring, we are just talking about the zero ring. Mm -hmm. So is this ring non-trivial at all? We could also ask this uh, before doing all these localizations. I mean, even if we just take all isomorphism classes of varieties and mod out by the cut and paste relation. What survives? What properties of varieties survive under this operation? And uh, well, in fact, something survives. This is actually non-trivial because there is uh, a non-trivial map to, to another ring. Yeah? And this is the uh, virtual Hodge polynomial. So. Okay, let me try to, to motivate this a little bit with the notion of a uh, motivic invariant. A motivic invariant of varieties is some invariant of varieties which fulfills the cut and paste relation. Yeah? For example, one uh, motivic invariant of varieties is its Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic satisfies the cut and paste relation. Euler characteristic of x is additive on taking an open and the closed complement. Or for example, if you, have, uh, if you work over finite fields, then counting point over finite fields is obviously a motivic invariant because it satisfies cut and paste. Yeah? So these are so-called motivic invariants. And the classes in the gotenich of varieties, these motives, these are some of the universal motivic invariants. Yeah? That's the universal domain where you have this cut and paste relation. So, in proving that this uh, motivic generating series, uh, th this motivic ring is non trivial, we just have to exhibit an interesting enough um, motivic invariant. So, Euler characteristic doesn't do the trick because, well, 1 minus L to the n, well, the Euler characteristic of the affine line or of any affine space is 1. And so, the Euler characteristic. Uh, evaluates this to zero and we cannot invert it. Yeah? So Euler characteristic is not a good example, but we need the virtual Hodge polynomial. So the virtual Hodge polynomial 
gives actually a ring homomorphism from Grotendieck ring of varieties to, sorry, so what target do we take? Let's just say uh, Laurent polynomials in two variables x and y, namely you map x to sum over all uh, p and q, sum over all k, sine twist by minus 1 to the k, and then it's h, p, q, h, k, c, x, c, I will explain. Okay. <coughs> so, yes, so, so, so this is compactly supported cohomology. Homology with compact support. So that's the case, compactly supported cohomology. And HPQ, that's the uh, Hodge de Linie numbers of this. Yeah? So it comes from the mixed Hodge structure on, on this cohomology. So, so these are the Hodge de Linie numbers. Oh, the dimension, of course, I take. Sorry, sorry. The dimension. No, I'm fine. No, it's, it's, it's just really the Hodge de Linie numbers are in case cohomology. Hodge de Linie numbers, so these are already dimensions, signed by k, and then I record p and q. Yeah. Okay, and so by de Linie's theory, this invariant is motivic. It fulfills the cut and paste relation. And it's compatible with the product. Yeah, if you take the Cartesian product of two varieties, then this behaves multiplicatively as Laurent polynomials. And uh, we can compute it for the affine line. Left shed's motive is sent to xy. Yeah? And uh, so it's sent to xy. So, and something survives after localization. Yeah? So localizing at uh, L plus minus one half just means introducing uh, a square root of xy in its inverse. And these localizations just mean we need denominators one minus xy to the n. Yeah? Something survives. <coughs> so this, uh, this ring homomorphism is non-trivial. This is good news. And uh, finally, It might seem like uh, like this ring is uh, that might seem like everything's fine with this ring, this R mod, but it is not because um, now the surprising thing is well, it is already known since uh, 20 years ago that this Gottendieck ring of varieties has zero divisors. And the situation is even worse. This is only known since a few years. The Lefschetz motive, the class of the affine line, is a zero divisor. Yeah. Yeah? And uh, in constructing this ring, we are localizing at a zero divisor, which is fine, but we are, of course, losing many, many things. And uh, let me just very briefly discuss this. So this localized ring of motives is non-trivial because we have an interesting invariant, but L is a zero divisor in K0 of complex varieties. There exists uh, varieties X, non-isomorphic varieties X and Y. In fact, there are actually three Calabi-Yau varieties such that difference of their motives times 6 power of uh, Lefschetz motive is 0. 
which in particular means, <coughs> well, Alice zero divisor. So if we localize at the zero divisor, then we are automatically identifying x and y, which are different varieties. Yeah? So in localizing this, we are making many, many identifications, but we are but we know that something survives because, for example, we can still detect the virtual Hodge polynomial. What do we know about the kernel of this map? Ha. Uh, me, personally, nothing. <laughs> no, I don't know what is known about this. <coughs> I mean, what, what is known, this is this, uh, this birrationality story. If you, if you take the Rotenik ring of varieties and just mod out the left shed's motive, then what you get is the, uh, the monoid ring or up of varieties up to uh, stable rationality, for example. But about the kernel of this map, I don't know. Luckily for us, in the quiver situation, uh, all the calculations will happen in, uh, in the subring generated by the left shed's motive. Yeah? We will only work, but this is nothing we know a priori. We only know it a posteriori. We will only work in the subring generated by, by L. So everything will be just a, um, a rational expression in L. Everything we produce, but we only know a posteriori. Yeah, so we will make some computations in this ring and then at the end it will turn out that actually everything is like a polynomial or is, is like a rational function in the left shed's motive, but this we don't know from the beginning. <coughs> okay, so this ends part one of the talk. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, so for this, this uh, construction of the x and y that, uh, that you mentioned, uh, how do we know they're not the same class, given that if you take like virtual Hodge polynomial, they match the same thing? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I looked this up yesterday evening, <laughs> just to make sure. I, I, I don't remember the details. But, I mean, <clears throat> so, um, I can look up the reference for you. And uh, it's a, quite a short paper. And not so terribly difficult to read, apparently. And these varieties X and Y are really explicit, but I don't remember. And also another question. If you remember the cohomological degree of the T to the K, is it also a motivic invariant or no? Uh, no. 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 <laughs> so, uh, so just if you just take, say, the, the, um, the Poincaré polynomial, that's not a motivic invariant. Oh, that's maybe another good example of what is not a motivic invariant, yes. That's maybe good. Poincaré polynomial is not motivic. Namely, look at um, A1, single point, and the complement, A1 without the point. And let's just, uh, over the complex numbers, and let's just look at, uh, at cohomology. Yeah? And um, then for the point, <coughs> cohomology with compact support. Singular cohomology with compact support. Then for the point, we have a cohomological degree. Uh, and then we have a one-dimensional zeroth cohomology, and that's it. A1 has a second compactly supported cohomology. <coughs> but uh, A1 minus a point, if you just pinch the, then you can uh, retract everything to an S1, and then you have uh, cohomology in degree 0 and 1. And you see this doesn't add up. Yeah? What instead of the Poincaré polynomial you can do, and this is a specialization of the virtual Hodge polynomial, is the virtual Poincaré polynomial which uh, is not the, uh, the Poincaré polynomial for compactly supported cohomology, but you take the Linz weight filtration and the associated graded. And that again does the trick. Okay. Yeah. 
But that's the reason why, why this doesn't work. I mean, for, for smooth projective varieties, you can just take the usual Poincare polynomial, usual Hodge polynomial, yeah? But uh, for arbitrary singular uh, non-projective varieties, you have to take these virtual guys. All right. Quivers. So now we have this Gottlieb ring of varieties, which is not only useful for, for this enumerative uh, geometry of quivers, which we will do here, but this is also very useful for the whole topic of, for example, motivic integrations, motivic zeta functions of varieties, <coughs> namely the motivic, well, one possible motivic zeta function of variety. Well, zeta function usually is something involving the arithmetic of variety. Uh, where you count point over finite fields. But how do you do this with a, with a complex variety? Well, the idea in motivic integration for motivic zeta functions is to take a complex variety and take its, uh, its jet spaces, the nth jet space. So kx mod x to the n valued points. Take the motors of, of all of them and put them together into a, a generating series, a zeta function. Yeah? And this is also a whole area which opens up when you know this uh, Gordonic ring of varieties. Quivers. So this is usually um, a topic where you can spend lots of time because it involves lots of notation. So. Um, I will just start somewhere, and if I don't give enough notation, quiver notation, then please tell me. So in particular, if I have never seen these uh, quivers and their representations, this will be uh, quite difficult, and I have to spend more time on that. So please just tell me if you want more details. Okay, so quiver is a finite, a quiver Q is a finite directed graph with a set of vertices which we call Q0 and with arrows which I will just write as, as maps alpha from i to j is an arrow between vertices i and j. That's a quiver. And uh, examples. That's a great quiver. That's the quiver we have to study first. Just a single vertex. Okay. A single vertex and a loop also makes a very interesting quiver. Two vertices and a single arrow, something we'll study. Two, arrow, two vertices and two parallel arrows two vertices and two arrows in both directions. A vertex with two loops. Well, and of course, lots of complicated things. Well, whatever, yeah? So uh, loops at vertices, multiple edges, everything is allowed. But uh, we will actually be happy with studying these, these very small Quivers. So that's a quiver. And um, <coughs> what else do we need? Um, okay, we need representations of a quiver. So I promised at the very beginning of the talk this will be a, a class of categories which is quite similar to coherent sheaves on, uh, on smooth projective curves. So let me introduce this category of representations. category of representations of such a quiver Q over a field which is just for us, just the complex numbers. So what are the objects? What are the representations? The objects are tuples Vi, so 
sorry, vi indexed by i and f alpha indexed by alpha. And let me explain. So the objects in this category are tuples, where this is a complex finite dimensional complex vector space. So you put a finite dimensional complex vector space at each vertex of your graph. Okay, so if you put a vector space at each vertex, then at each arrow you can put a linear map. See linear map. And that's it. That's a quiver representation. Yeah? So a quiver representation is a configuration of vector spaces and linear maps along a certain graph. So for example, a representation of this quiver means you choose two vector spaces, a map from the left to the right, and from the right to the left, linear maps, and that's it. Okay, that's the, that's an ob that's the object, and what are the morphisms? So a morphism, phi from V to W, where V is a collection of vector spaces and linear maps, and W is also a collection of vector spaces and linear maps. A morphism phi from V to W is a collection of linear maps between the vector spaces which are involved, such that so the easiest way to remember this definition is such that all diagrams commute. And then trying to figure out what these diagrams are, uh, you already see the definition. Let's do this. such that all diagrams commute. What diagrams do we get from all this data? Okay, so here we have a quiver representation V, and here we have a quiver representation W. And now we have one arrow, alpha from I to J in our graph. Associated to this arrow, we have a linear map, F alpha, from the vector space VI to VJ. That's this data. We have something similar for the sector representation, WI, wj and a map say g alpha. Okay, so now a morphism from v to w consists of morphism linear maps between the vector spaces. So we have a linear map here phi i and a linear map here phi j. That's the square diagram and you can ask it to commute. And this should hold for all arrows alpha from i to j. That's it. Okay, um, that's the objects, and now we need, uh, that's morphisms, and we need a composition of morphisms. Well, that's easy, because we can compose such uh, linear maps component-wise. Composition is component-wise. That's it. So that's a category you, you can define out of a graph. And now the question is, why do you want to do this? And uh, let me tell you. Well, first of all, you might define this category because you're interested in solving linear algebra problems. That's a quite natural problem. You have a configuration of vector spaces and linear maps, and you want to classify it up to base change. And this is precisely what this definition of morphism does. So just look at this diagram for a second and assume that these maps here are isomorphisms. Then this means that the second representation you get from the first one by a base change. First you take a base change here in the origin, then you take this map, and then you perform base change in the target. 
So, note that isomorphism classes in this category rep CQ, which I just defined, um, classify certain linear algebra, uh, classify configurations, classify configurations of vector spaces and linear maps, namely configurations along a graph, along Q, up to base change. So this is a category where the isomorphism problem solves a linear algebra problem of classifying configurations of vector spaces and linear maps. Which is quite good. Okay. Maybe not what we are interested in, you are interested in originally. So fact is that this category has all the nice properties you uh, expect from categories of modules or sheaves, namely it is equivalent to the category of modules over an algebra, a non-commutative algebra called the path algebra of Q. So-called path algebra of Q. So representations of a quiver form a category of modules. In particular, it is an abelian category. It is a category of finite dimensional modules. So all objects have finite length filtrations. You have the jordan hölder theorem. You have the Kull-Schmidt theorem. You can do homological algebras because this category has enough projectives and injectives and so on. Very nice, very nice abelian categories. And one important thing is that the global dimension of this category of modules or of this algebra is just one. Yeah? So, and this is the similarity to coherent sheaves on smooth projective curves. We're talking about hereditary categories. We only have to take care of x0 and 1 and uh, all higher x vanish anyway, which is great news, in particular for defining moduli spaces. Yeah? If you have ever worked with moduli spaces of, uh, of vector bundles on smooth projective curves, you really appreciate vanishing of higher x. Because, for example, it makes the moduli spaces uh, smooth and so on. Okay, that's this category. And um, what else do we need before I can define? All right, we need the uh, so-called homological Euler form. So let me define the so-called dimension vector. dimension vector of a representation V. Well, what could be the, the dimension of a representation V? Well, the representation V in particular involves vector spaces, namely one vector space uh, for each vertex. So let's just take the tuple of all the dimension of the vector spaces VI, and this defines an element in NQ0. So that's the dimension vector of the representation. And then I will define the so-called Euler form, and this is then the final ingredient for definitions, I think, more or less. The Euler form, acute brackets, is defined, these are two vectors, it's defined as sum over all i, d i e i, minus sum over all arrows, d i e j. So this is the Euler form of, of the quiver Q. At the moment, that, that's just a combinatorially defined thing because it just involves the graph structure. Yeah? It involves the structure of vertices and arrows of our graph. But now we will see that this Euler form, as you can already guess from the name, is the homological Euler form of this category of representations. So. Uh, So this, this formula, okay, let me write it down, 
and then discuss it. We take the space of homomorphisms from V to W, namely homomorphisms of quiver representations. Yeah? And the notion of morphisms of quiver representations as we defined it uh, above. Do we have this notion there? I do hope so. Ah, here we go. These are morphisms. They actually form uh, a vector space. This is a k-linear category. And so you can take the dimension of this space of homomorphisms. We have enough projective and injective so we can define x1. So the next term in the homological Euler form would be x2, but this vanishes identically. So that's the homological Euler form. That's just the difference of x0 and x1. And this is given by evaluating this special form at the dimension vectors of V and W. So, this Euler form is really just given in terms of, this, of the graph structure because it just involves the structure of, of uh, vertices and arrows. So this is something you can directly calculate. And this is the homological Euler form. So this is of the same uh, importance as Riemann-Roch is for the theory of, uh, of, of sheaves on curves. Yeah? All right. That's why this form is so important. Okay. And now I should really come to the final definition. Okay, um, so the fancy way of, of continuing is to say there is something like the, called the moduli stack of isomorphism classes of quiver representations and we just take the generating functions of the classes of all these stacks. But this is not really fair because I haven't defined what the class, the motive of a, of a stack is. So let me do this in a more elementary way. So let me define something like the moduli stack of representations. But I don't really want to use stacks, so I try to avoid it and do it in a more elementary way. Namely, um, we write down a universal parameter space for quiver representations of a fixed dimension vector, and then we mod out by the equivalence relation of taking isomorphism classes. And we'll see that this is a quotient stack by a product of groups GL. And I think I can use these five, five minutes? Five minutes is definitely enough. Okay. Okay. So fix a dimension vector D. And then I define Rd of Q as the direct sum along all the arrows of the space of linear maps from a di dimensional to a dj dimensional vector space. A point in here is a quiver representation on the vector spaces c to the di. A point or a c-valued point, a point in this space is a quiver representation on the vector spaces C to the di. And since the vector spaces are fixed anyway up to isomorphism, once we have fixed their dimension, this is no restriction at all. Yeah? So instead of taking quiver representations on arbitrary vector spaces vi, we can always assume that we have quiver representations on spaces C to the di. So a point in this here is a quiver representation. So when are two quiver representations isomorphic? I already explained this. The important keyword is base change. And so I will define a group action on this by the group GD. And the group GD is nothing else than a product over general linear groups. And this acts on this variety by base change. And the formula will actually resemble uh, the adjoint action for a group, just conjugation action. Let me write down the formula for this action. 
because we should have it here on the blackboard. Here's the formula for the action. So a tuple GI, no, a tuple phi i of invertible matrices acts on a tuple F alpha of linear maps by GJ F alpha GI inverse where alpha is an arrow from i to j. And the g is of course again a phi, sorry, phi. So this looks like an adjoint action. Yeah? g times f times g, uh, phi times f times phi inverse. Is that readable? Every g is assumed to be a phi, sorry. This is a base change action. You're doing the inverse in the or origin, then going f alpha, then phi j in the target. Phi i inverse, f alpha, phi j. Okay, so you have a group action on a variety, and the observation is, so and this is a tautological observation, the GD orbits in RD of Q are the isomorphism classes of representations of Q of dimension vector D. So, and we should have a 30 second meditation on this, on this observation and really see that it is tautological. So a point in this affine space here, this is just affine space, just a direct sum of spaces of linear maps, just an affine space. A point in this affine space is a quiver representations on these vector spaces. And we can always assume without loss of generalities that the rect vector spaces involved are the C to the di. Two such points define isomorphic quiver representations by this definition of morphisms, if and only if they are related by this formula. So if and only they are conjugate under this group action. So if and only if they are in the same orbit for the group action. Yeah? So just from the very definition, the GD orbits are the isomorphism classes of representations. Okay, and this brings us to the final definition for today and to the end of the talk. Because now we can say what this moduli stack should really be. and what the counting of quiver representations should be. This brings us back to the logic from the very beginning. So this moduli stack should be no nothing else than the quotient stack of the space by the group. So these brackets now mean the quotient stack. Yeah? But I don't want to use stacks anyway, but uh, just as a side remark, the moduli stack by definition is the quotient stack of this space by this group. Okay, so now we can say what is the count of quiver representations. So what's counting quiver representations? Now means the following. Well, first of all, we can count in any dimension, in any dimension vector d. In any fixed dimension vector d, we should take the count of points of this quotient stack. So we can define this. Namely, we take the corresponding classes in the Grotendieck group of varieties. We take the motif of the space and divide by the motif of this group. And if you solve this little exercise, computing the motif of, GL, of GLN, then you will see that uh, everything appearing here, the denominator, is something we localized at any way. Well, for good reasons, which I can't explain, explain at the moment, we will take the virtual motives and then 
at the end we should form a huge partition function. So we should uh, sum up over all dimension vectors, keeping track of the dimensions, because that's a numerical invariant. And this is a function, this is a motivic generated function AQ. Great sound showing the importance of this, uh, of this definition. So this is the, the central definition. So, okay, I, I haven't told you yet where this lives. So what are these extra formal variables t to the d? This I will explain tomorrow. And then we will try to factor this. Well, this is something like a partition function or zeta function or whatever. And of course the impulse is then to factor it into a product of something. Yeah, like you do with any zeta function or partition function. And this we will do here. And in trying to factor this, uh, all sorts of moduli st spaces associated to quiver representations will pop up almost automatically. And that's the, the miracle. Okay, that's enough for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>《ハウデュー》オーケーラッキーデューインインコミュニティブアルジェブラーラッキーデューインコミュニティブアルジェブラーラッキーデュー So it's really like you have an arbitrary commutative ring Rs, you really adjoin a formal variable t and then uh, mod out by s times t equals 1 to, to make t invertible. And yes, of course, if, if this is a zero divisor, then you make certain things uh, zero. So in I wrote down this relation in the Grotnik ring of varieties where you have two Calabi-Yaus which after multiplying by the sixth power of the left shed's motif becomes zero. So in particular in our localized ring of motifs this thing is zero. So these classes are the same. So that just means this localized Grotnik ring cannot distinguish many many varieties which are definitely non-isomorphic. But, uh, well, we know that at least something survives and that's enough for us at the moment. Yeah. There is one question in the Zoom. Is it possible to analytically continue the construction with respect to the dimension vector? Analytically continue? Um, Sometimes. Um, well, okay, so unfortunately I didn't have time for, for the first example. So what we will do tomorrow as a start is taking this, this series and uh, writing down a factorization in, in these two rings. Uh, let, me, let me just show you this, this. Yeah, let me give it as an exercise. So um, if Q is the trivial quiver, well, that's the same as in algebraic geometry. If you have a new concept, then you should first explore what does it mean for the variety a single point. And there you should understand it, yeah, before starting to do it for whatever variety. And so if you have a concept for quiver representation, just take the quiver, which is just a, a single vertex. The category of representations is just the category of vector spaces. That's a category you really understand. So we should understand this motivic generating series. And even then, this motivic generating series is nothing uh, completely trivial. It admits a factorization, and this we'll see tomorrow, uh, as an infinite product over one minus L to the I plus one half times formal variable T. So, and that's kind of a typical phenomenon. And, uh, well, okay, then you can start exploring the uh, analytic continuation properties of such uh, infinite products. Yeah. Um, okay, two more questions. Yes, okay. How much about Q can we recover from AQ? 
Ha ha. <laughs> um, so formally, well, okay. Not that much, not as much as you would expect, because I was cheating a little bit. Um, it's not only about the series, but it's also the ring, the so-called multivic quantum torus in which we consider it. And uh, this ring in which we consider this AQ and in which we will factor it, will contain more information than AQ itself. So for example, this AQ is the same uh, at the moment whether you consider this quiver or this quiver but these quivers are drastically different in their representation theoretic behavior and uh, it will depend on, uh, on, on the motivic quantum torus in which we will consider and factor this thing. And this is something we will only see tomorrow. But this was AQ is independent of the orientation. The uh, AQ is, is not dependent on this, but, but the ring in which we view it, because I, uh, yeah, the ring in which, so we will view this in some, uh, in some formal power series ring, which will depend on, on Q, really on the orientation. Yeah, so there, there is some extra bit which I couldn't define yet. There is one more question. Yes. How the formula of the Euler form of dimension vectors, which was stated, is proved? How it is proved? With a, with a standard resolution. Yeah, you, you write down a standard projective resolution. Um, this is quite classical and, uh, well, Okay, so I, I, I can't do it now because I had to introduce a uh, um, bit of notation. Yes, I can sketch it. No. Okay. Well, maybe not in all details, but let me j just give you the flair of, of how you write down this, this standard resolution. And, um, ah, okay. Either with a standard resolution or with the following exact sequence. Yes, okay, let me do it like this. done and then I can explain. So in the uh, these two middle terms here are just spaces of uh, linear maps. Yeah? And uh, an element in here looks like a couple of these phi's. And uh, a couple of to this such tuple of the phi's I associate precisely the thing which I asked to commute, namely this um, f alpha phi j minus phi i G alpha indexed by alpha from i to j. Okay, so this is the thing which commutes in this diagram defining morphisms. So in particular this means if phi i is mapped to zero under this map, then phi i defines a homomorphism of quiver representations. Okay, on the other hand, um, if you realize the x1 in in the naive sense, namely as equiv equivalence classes of exact sequences. Then, writing this down in all details, you will see that x1 is actually elements in here modulo the image of this map. Or you can see it by some standard projective resolution of representations. And this gives you such a four-term exact sequence. Now just compare, compare dimensions. Dimensions of this minus dimension of this is the homological Euler form. It's the same as dimension of this space minus dimension of this space, and this difference is precisely given by the Euler form. So, fancy would be to really work with standard resolutions, but it's just a linear algebra thing, actually. There was one more question in the audience. Uh, so, if you take a re representation value the different abelian pi with them, uh, vector spaces, how much can we uh, do the similar thing as in the vector space rep representations? Ah, so if, ah, if you take quiver representations in some other abelian category. In coherent sheaves, for example, yeah. Um, 
yes, there are relative versions of many of these constructions. So, for example, uh, there is an analog of of, of this standard resolution and of these homological properties which shows that the global dimension of the category of representations in a category A is one more than the global dimension of, of A. Yeah, so there exist relative versions of, of all this. What about the factorization you are going to talk about? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, this factorization uh, at a very deep point uses the fact that everything is hereditary that we are really in global dimension one. And uh, you, can, you, you can push this from, yeah, I mean, all these factorizations really work smoothly only for a hereditary category. And you can push it to the two Calabi-Yau or three Calabi-Yau situation, in certain situations. But that's it. But if you just consider queer representations in some arbitrary category of coherent sheaves, I doubt that you get such nice factorizations, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, one more question in the back. Does one have a notion of shared duality in this? Yes. There is a shared duality, which uh, classically is called the Orthland Arrayton translation. So there exists a um, so called Orthland Arrayton translation. Tor. Uh, which you can realize, which you can write down as um, uh, you take the x1 with with the path algebra itself, which is something like the regular representation in the second component and then dualizing, but now I, def I wrote down to our inverse. That's tau, okay. And then you have um, the formula x1 mn is isomorphic to hom n tau m dualized. And that's really quite literally sad duality in this one dimensional setup. Yeah, you have this duality from x1 to uh, x0 dualized by applying this, uh, this sad functor. Any other question? Quick question? Is, is your virtual class deformation variant in any sense? I don't know what a deformation would be in this situation. I don't know. Okay. Well, well, yeah. Fair enough. <coughs> no more questions. Let's thank Marcus again. Thank you.